essentially the way we're gonna do this, I'll be, I'll ask you questions and um, Jay might pop in, ask some questions too, but just try to answer back to me, just so we're kind of always looking in the same direction. Okay. And then I'm gonna sit here so we're kind of eye to eye. And you don't need to look in the camera, you just look directly at me. Okay. And um, Jay will be recording some kind of handheld stuff off to the sides. You don't just try not to. <laughs> just ignore you. Yeah, just yeah. ignore him. Okay. Incredible. Um, <laughs> and then otherwise, um, we'll probably have you actually step out to the side and then come and like sit down just so we kind of get that action of you coming and oh, sitting. Just come over here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then, but you can wait one second. I'm just going to make sure our sound is good and everything. And I'm going to get situated okay, is this in a seat. Recording. Yeah, you, I mean, you should. That scratch is always on. Here, I'm going to sit where you are, Jay. Situated there. I'll go around. <laughs> Didn't leave yourself much room there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this stuff. It's nice to have, but it takes up space. <laughs> There, I'll watch this one. I'm just gonna keep, keep an eye on that one. Okay. So I'm just gonna check levels, and then we'll do the. We'll have you stand up and come back and sit down. Okay. All that. So. Okay. Get situated here. All right. Can you say your name for me? Tammy Carver. And one more time. Tammy Carver. All right. Okay, we are officially recording. So, if you want to, yep, you can do your thing. All right. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, okay, so now we'll do the official name. Uh, so you can just tell us your name and your daughter's name and kind of, you know, where we are today. My name is Tammy Carver. Um, my youngest daughter is Juliana Carver and um, she fought cancer for over nine and a half years, um, beginning back in 2007. Um, she passed away um, in 2016, just six weeks before her 15th birthday. So she was 14 and a half. Yeah. So can you, can you tell us a little bit about her story? Um, sure. She was, um, she turned five in December and she came to us one Sunday morning in February, two months later, and said, there's a bump under my arm that's bugging me on a Sunday morning. And I felt under her arm and it was, it was strange. Um, I have a little bit of a science background, so I, I knew it was a swollen lymph node and I looked and couldn't find any sores or any she hadn't had any injuries or anything that would have caused that so it was very concerning but not much you can do on a sunday morning so monday morning i called her pediatrician and uh, she's the youngest of six and when i called and said i had an emergency they believed me so i took her in and the pediatrician was stumped and um, got an x-ray right away and could see that something was there but couldn't tell what so she, the, her pediatrician was so concerned, she actually got us an emergency MRI that same afternoon. And um, that evening, um, we got a call from the pediatrician and she said, it, it looks like cancer. So um, she arranged for us to go to Sinai Hospital and, um, and, and meet with the oncologist the following morning and um, they looked at the scans and agreed that it definitely did look like cancer. So they started the whole workup procedure, biopsies and more and more scans. And um, they told us, we had the biopsy a couple days later and the surgeon told us that it was definitely rhabdomyosarcoma, but they needed to send it to a special lab, find out what kind. And it, it took weeks to get the workup finished. Um, in the meantime, the primary was tumor was right here, kind of, you couldn't see it from this angle, but you could see it swollen right along her forearm and we're watching it like get bigger, bigger. It was pretty scary because um, it grows really fast. So they started treatment. 
Um, she got her treatment at Sinai. We did a whole year of treatment and she responded like immediately. We watched it just melt away. Um, when she was diagnosed, she was stage three, group three, which means she had um, metastasis, but just local metastasis, not distant. So it's like the step before stage four. Um, so everything, a year later, everything was gone. She was, she was fine. We were finished treatment. Um, and you know, we just, we just thought it was done. We thought she was, she was going to be fine and tried to go back to life as normal, as much as you can. She got scans every three months to start, and then we gradually spread them out to four months and six months. And um, she made it three years, almost to the week, three years past the end of treatment. And then she relapsed the first time. So um, when she relapsed the first time, she was, um, let me see, she was five, nine. So um, this time we found a lymph node in her groin that she told me was a bruise, and I was like, that is not a bruise, so uh, it was a new tumor in her leg. So we went back to Sinai, started the whole procedure again, did a whole nother workup, um, a different treatment this time. Um, both times there were clinical trials that she was in because unfortunately, there aren't any drugs that have ever been developed for the type of cancer she has, not one. So all they do is they just take other drugs that are used for adult cancers and they kind of try to repurpose them and they do trials where they try different combinations to see if it works better than the current one they're using. So she was involved in the second clinical trial um, and again, it, it worked. Um, this one actually didn't make her as sick, the second one, um, it worked. We went through a whole nother full year of treatment, including radiation therapy both times. Um, she, it was gone, Could, couldn't find any in the last scan, um, but this time it was just a couple of months later she relapsed, so it was almost immediate. And um, when she relapsed this time, um, it, was, it was more serious because she had a tumor wrapping around her aorta and the vena cava, and it was, it was bad, so um, that time we got, you know, we had to take her in as an emergency. They had to start blood thinners, um, put in a, a Hickman line, and we had to stay in the hospital until they could start treatment because if it continued growing, it was it was ready to cut circulation off to the lower half of her body. So we started a very, very aggressive new treatment that made her so sick. Um, and it worked. They couldn't believe it worked actually because within a few weeks the tumor had shrunk enough that she was, you know, she could go off a blood thinner. She was no longer in danger. Um, we made it through that treatment and it was, it was a bear. It was all inpatient, um, made it through that. Then we had to, she had to do more radiation therapy and um, because it was, it was abdominal and the chest area we had to separate it so she had like 12 straight with the entire summer we went to radiation every single weekday the entire summer she had six weeks here then six weeks here and it made her especially the um the abdominal radiation made her really sick there's nothing like nausea that's caused because of abdominal radiation it's bad um so she made it through all of that and um at that point we decided just to try putting her on um, low dose chemotherapy just to try to keep it from coming back so we did that we did um we did different combinations we we switched it up every few months and we kept that going for uh, it, it was almost a year and a half i believe we kept that going just changing it up and um, i also tried some natural stuff at that point just to try to stave it off and it worked somehow it worked she she stayed cancer free she had a really good solid um, year where she felt really good um, and then it came back again so um, once it came back again and it was it was kind you know it was it was again an abdomen in the chest area um, 
we just we knew we needed to do something else because we already tried all the protocols they had we talked to you know our our um, oncologist her onco primary oncologist had reached out to lots of different experts and specialists around the country um, and they couldn't that there really were no other treatment options that anyone had available so the only thing that they could come up with was to try a bone marrow transplant, which was another clinical trial, um, something that they had just started trying to do, and it was um, um, a haploidentical, which means it was half match, half mismatch, is what they wanted um, to try. So we had to go to Hopkins for that. So we arranged that, and Juliana, um, we adopted Juliana when she was 20 months old from Minsk, Belarus. So um, we also adopted her biological sister, and um, unfortunately, her sister Christina was not a match. We couldn't use her bone marrow, so we actually had to track down her birth mother in Belarus and have someone. We, we actually, the Belarusian government was extraordinarily helpful to us. They put us, you know, in contact with someone who contacted her, and she agreed that she would donate bone marrow. So we flew her here so that they could harvest the bone marrow. And um, Juliana had the transplant April 29, 2016. Um, it was really rough. You know, all kinds of stuff went wrong. She ended up with um, idiopathic pneumonia, and then they had to give her all these really high dose steroids to try to combat that because she couldn't breathe. And then, um, that caused horrendous bleeding, um, like her entire GI tract was bleeding. It was, it, it was bad. She was getting platelet and blood transfusions literally every day. So finally got that to heal up. That was a little medical medicine issue that I have with the doctors. But we got that straightened out and got her healed up and um, it didn't work is, is the long and short. Um, the cancer came back again and at that point there, there weren't any other really good options um, that we could come up with. There were some things that we were hoping would buy her some more time but um, she actually got to the point where she could, she, she had a, um, a drain in her lung because she had fluid around her lung and I was draining it, it was a fluorox catheter, I was draining it at home, it stayed in, and I went to drain it at home the beginning of October 2016, and I got like four times the amount of fluid that I normally would have out of it, and I was like, oh boy. So I, I called her nurse at um, Hopkins and told her what happened, she said bring her in. By the time we got her in there, she left the house still able to breathe ambient air. By the time we got to the hospital and got her into the clinic, she was starting to struggle, so they put her on just some regular oxygen, just a little, like two maybe. And then she can, it, it's, it's progressed, started progressing really rapidly, and they, they're turning it up, turning it up, and then they said, came in and said, we got it, she's gotta admit be admitted to the PICU because she can't breathe this, we're gonna to have to do pressurized oxygen. So pick you just downstairs. They took her downstairs to pick you and um, gave her pressurized oxygen. It still wasn't working. Meanwhile, they came in and did an echocardiogram and found out that she had, um, she was in something called tamponade because she had a pericardial effusion. And it was gonna be between that and and the fluid buildup in the lungs, it, they were gonna to have to intubate her and they weren't sure that she was gonna make it because of having all the fluid around her heart in addition to the fluid in her lungs, they weren't sure of it, what was gonna happen and so they actually had a special team of people come in and talk to us and say, um, that was um, October 7th, 2016, they said, you need to go say goodbye to your daughter because we don't know if she's gonna make it. So we went in and talked to her, and I, I didn't actually say goodbye that day because I, I just couldn't. And um, I mostly just comforted her, told her it was oh, going to be okay. They are going to do a procedure to make her be able to breathe better. Um, took us out of the room. They, they did it, and um, 
her heart, she did go into arrest. Her heart stopped for two minutes. They were able to resuscitate her and get her intubated and stabilized. And um, she was in PICU for a week um, with, with uh, intubated and it was gradually getting better. So they weaned her off, which they were just shocked because they didn't expect that to happen. They were able to wean her off. They were able to extubate her and just had her on um, pressurized oxygen at night when she was sleeping and regular oxygen in the daytime. So when we, when we got to that point, I was, she wanted to go. She hated hospitals. Goodness, Julie hated hospitals. So um, I was like, can we take her home? Because there's no reason to keep her here just because of oxygen. I can do oxygen, I can do CPAP at home. So we made the arrangements to go home and um, on the 20th, she was just like really seemed to be doing well on October 20th. She was she was talking. She talked the nurse's ear off that night. She ate dinner. I mean, she started eating again. She, you know, we shared a piece of cheesecake together. She seemed really, really doing well. Um, the next morning when we were getting ready to go home that morning, she, it was a big change. And I... We still don't know exactly what happened. They said that they thought it was too much morphine and that it would wear off, but she was just really groggy, really out of it. Not, not the same child she was the day before. Um, we took her home anyway. By that point, once she relapsed after the bone marrow transplant, they had us put her on hospice because we knew that there wasn't any cure out there anymore. And unlike with adults, when children are on hospice, you can still do treatment. Adults, you can't, but children, you can. So we were still able to try different things and, and do, you know, do treatments um, with her on it. So we took her home and she just progressively, the, the next day she was even worse. Um, and I called the hospice nurse and that's another long story. They did not show up to help me. Um, by Sunday morning, I was so upset, I actually called her pediatrician, her pediatric oncologist, I should say, at Sinai, her long-term one she'd been with for over nine years. I called him at home on a Sunday morning, and, um, and he, he said, you know, she, he was like, Tammy, there she's, I said, what should I do? He said, she's, she's, she's dying, you know, he's the one that taught, the nurse never showed up, she told me that, um, you know, she was, her body shutting down and that moving her probably wasn't a good option. It was probably gonna make things worse. So um, we called all of her family and told them, you know, come see her. And um, we, had a, we had her, a blow up bed right next to ours in our bedroom. And um, so she was sleeping right next to us. And um, we got up, I guess, Monday early in the morning and checked on her and um, her breathing was real shallow and I was only meant to doze off but after two weeks in the PICU of not sleeping I was so tired that I dozed for longer than I thought and we woke up like an hour and a half later and she was gone. So we had planned to start a new treatment a few days after that so it was totally we, we we knew i mean you knew we knew she was bad and wasn't going to get better but we didn't know she was going to go that quickly after you know bringing her home um so she passed away october 24th 2016. so her she would have she would have turned 15 in december on december 4th so she didn't make it to her 15th birthday <coughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a powerful story. Thank you for sharing. Um, can you tell us about her, her personality? Just, you know. She was. Sure. Oh, sorry. Are you okay? Just pull it out. There you go. There you go. Hopefully, you can edit that. Um. Juliana, what she she was an amazing little girl. She was extremely positive. Um, always saw the glass half half. You know, it wasn't ever half empty. It was half, it was it was half full. Um, 
she, uh, when she was little, she was just, she was so spunky. She was the spunkiest little toddler. Um, when we met her the first time in Belarus, and she was 20 months old, we went to a doctor, and um, they had told her that we were coming, the caregivers, and apparently they had her all excited. So when we came in, they told her in Russian, go give your mama a hug, and she was so cute. She was real petite always real petite and she ran over a little, a little as fast as her little legs would take her across the floor and jumped in my arms and gave me the biggest hug. I was like, oh my gosh, just melted my heart. She was such a sweetheart. Um, she was, I, I always call it a word I described her when she was little as spunky. She was spunky. <laughs> she was my climber. She climbed everything. Um, she kept up with the, she was the youngest of six and she kept up with the big kids. Um, she was also kind. I mean, she was she was kind and she was generous too. She always, every holiday, when she was little, she would make something. She would always make everybody cards, make everybody little homemade gifts and things like that for for holidays, birthdays. You know, um, she was always kind and giving, but definitely spunky. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> she obviously. The, the type of cancer she had, you said there was really no, no treatment for it. And that's, that's why I think it's so important that Giant and other, you know, organizations, you know, go after this because for, for pediatric cancers, there's just isn't much. I mean, can you, obviously you've been around this world a lot. Can you kind of tell us about that a little bit? Right. I mean, we were shocked to find out because they're always coming up with new medications for, for cancer. You always hear about it on the news, but right. When we found out that pediatric cancer, it's just, it's just, old drugs, I mean, drugs that are 20, 30, 40 years old, that they're just recombining in different ways to see what works against the cancers. And unlike adults, which you, adults are rarely involved in clinical trials, children are almost always involved in clinical trials because, I mean, as they explained to us the first time, if, if we don't do these clinical trials, we have so, there's so few kids that get can even though it didn't seem like it's us, because we know dozens and dozens of them, but in reality, there's so few kids that get cancer compared to adults that if you don't involve them in clinical trials, you're never gonna make any headway. So um, she was in three different clinical trials in the nine, well, not, not, well over nine and a half years that she fought. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very disheartening that they've never actually come up with an actual drug that treats this type of cancer that she had yeah do, do you know if um, you know now after the fact that did any of her trials help in the progression of yes the first one she was the one actually became the new standard of care wow. so it yeah the first one that she was on definitely did um, the last one she was on at Hopkins that was not a successful trial we found out that yeah. it was very unsuccessful they had like one, one child out of 20, I believe they enrolled that actually survived. Yeah. So it was not a su successful trial at all, but you know, they didn't know that of course at the beginning. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really bad because the reason they don't have drugs isn't because they couldn't develop drugs for, for childhood cancers especially the less common ones, because most kids with get cancer get like leukemia, and there are treatments that have been developed for that, not that many, but a couple, but for the rest of them that you know have more rare types like Julie had, it's just, it's all about the money, it's, which is, you know, I mean, it's, it's really bad, but it, it's all about the money, because if they spent all the money to develop the drug, they wouldn't make a profit, and so they don't, so, um, so when when was Juliana an ambassador for for Giants program? She was an ambassador in two thousand fifteen, which was that period between. It was it was during that good year she had, where we had her just on the maintenance. That was that was some mostly oral chemo, a couple infusions here and there, but mostly just oral, low dose oral, and she was feeling good. And yes, she was ambassador that year, and she had fun doing it too. Yeah. Yeah, so I was gonna say, how did she feel about that? Did she understand what she was, you know, doing? And, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She was, she was thirteen. She understood. Yeah. Um, 
she was a little nervous when she found out she had to give a speech. <laughs> that was that was the only thing she wasn't so sure. About. She was good with the pictures and you know going to events and you know meeting people, but she did really good for this for the speech. She actually got into it when she was finally got up there and and did it. So yeah. So so what do you think it meant to her to to be a part of of raising money and awareness of this? Yeah, I mean she was. She was the kind of person she always wanted to help people, so she, this was right up her alley. So she was she was fine with helping, and um, I mean, she always just thought she was kind of always like, "Well, why is anybody interested in me? It's, I'm not anybody important." I'm like, "Yeah, but you know what? You you are because people need to know about kids like you." So, and she was yeah, she was always happy to help, and um, and understood by that age that you know. It was to help raise awareness, to help raise money because there weren't, you know, she knew by then, she listened to all the conversations we were having with the doctor. She knew by then that there weren't any other medicines that she hadn't already tried that were likely to work that they knew of. So they needed more money to help figure that out. Yeah. Um, and. I guess now looking, kind of looking back, and Giants, you know, every year they have new ambassadors and things. I mean, um, looking back to that now and kind of where Giants gone. I mean, what what do you think about just a, a not even spend so much Giant, but like a an organization that that cares enough to give to be a part of something like this? I I think it's absolutely amazing what Giant does. Um, Honestly, when, when Juliana passed away, I know a lot of other parents who've lost their children as well. And they, everybody wants to, you want to do something, you know, to honor them and to, and, you know, and, and to help to keep this from happening to other parents. And a lot of them tried to start foundations and things like that. And John and I talked and we we're like, you know, we're not good fundraisers. We're, we're never going to be able to make any progress starting something on our own. But by then, John was... Um, already a board member with Children's Cancer Foundation and I know that they were doing you know work to try to raise money for for you know for new um, new drug development and research and, and also to, to help give money to, to the local children's hospitals which is important and we we're like you know what I think we just we need to concentrate our efforts in helping them and Giant is the biggest their biggest contributor by far. So without Giant, I don't think Children's Cancer Foundation would ever would even be able to to exist, let alone make the impact that they are. And, um, and they've given tens of thousands of dollars specifically to research into rhabdomyosarcoma in Juliana's name in the, over the past um, five years. So that's just that's amazing because we never we never could do that have done that on our own but through working with them and with the, specifically with giant support they're able to do that um john just had a board meeting the other day and they had the, one of the doctors come on and talk about the research she's doing right now on it so it's it's very encouraging um not not just and, and the research is probably my, our biggest thing but not just that but you know, we were at Sinai for over nine years, and when we first started going, we went to the old clinic and the old children's hospital. And I know that um, um, Children's Cancer Foundation donated, uh, I don't know, a million dollars or something to help them be able to have a nice new clinic and a nice new children's hospital. With New Children's Hospital had an actual hall that was just for oncology it was the door sealed it had the special hepa filters and it you know which was it was just not only was it nicer as far as accommodations go but it was better because it it was healthier you was nothing like sitting there in in the hospital with your you know with your five-year-old who has you know no white blood cell count he's an anc of zero and she's got a fever and you hear a kid across the hall just coughing and coughing and you're thinking, you know, that could be coming across the hall and she can't fight that off. So it, knowing, you know, being able to have those better facilities, that, that means a lot too. Um, I never saw the old ones at Hopkins, but the new ones are nice. So, you know, they help with, you know, that in addition to funding all the new research and the cutting edge research. And, and without, like I so said, without Giant, 
without their support, they wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. So it's, you know, they provide so much support to, to the local hospitals. Jay, do you have any questions? Um, no, I guess, uh, I don't know, can you just go through a little bit about, touch on a little bit about what it was like for her, some of the feelings that she felt throughout the ups and downs, like did she feel fear, did she feel, like what were some of the um, range of emotions that a child has to go through? Okay, that, that's good because when she, when she was first diagnosed, she just turned five, so how do you explain to a five-year-old they have cancer so um, we homeschooled and we have microscope and she had older brothers and sisters and I have been doing some microscope work with them and the little ones came in what's this what's this they wanted to see it so she knew what a cell was because she'd seen them in the microscope that you know while I was working with the older kids and so the only way I could think of it is Juliana you have some sick cells in your arm and we're gonna have to give you some really really strong medicine it's gonna make you sick to make them go away so when she was little, she, she didn't really have any fear of cancer because she didn't understand at five that cancer could kill you. She had no idea. She just thought she was going to take some medicine like she'd been sick before and then she'd get better and then she'd you know, go on and it wouldn't be a problem. So when she was little, it, she really didn't have that much fear. Even the, what, What's radiation, mommy? So I was like, um, it's strong sunshine and you might get a sunburn or suntan from it and so she kind of just bought those simple explanations and, and didn't really have any particular fear I mean, she just kept going and other than you know having some nausea and, and being uncomfortable during you know the first day of, of each round she really just kind of kept playing everybody was like she's she's supposed to be sick why she, you know it's like no she's a kid you don't understand so she really she really weathered the the early treatments well. It was when she got older that it started getting a lot harder. Um, I will never forget when she relapsed the second time and we took her into the hospital as an emergency to be admitted. And she, you know, she we they just put her in the hospital bed and got her all situated and the nurse had just stepped out after talking to me and she looked at me and said, Mommy, am I going to die? And I was like, oh, what do you, you know, so that was, that was when I realized she was older now. She was, she was 10 by then. She got it. And, you know, I mean, the, the only answer I could come up with quickly was we're all going to die, but nothing is going to happen to you right now. We're going to do more treatment and just like we've done before, we're going to do more chemo, more radiation probably to get rid of the cancer and, you know, but at that point it was harder because we knew she was older she understood and um and then as she hit her teen years i mean she she was always optimistic but when we would get bad news you know she would break down and cry and we just sit and you know sit and cry with her and hold her but for the most part she she just always looked on the positive side she liked to um, even when she was really sick she, she liked to listen to music that's one of the things she would do she would just sit and listen to music and she would play you know play her games on her um, DS that she had she liked to play and she would play video games and things like that but um, most of the time she handled it pretty well but there were moments when especially when we got bad news and then there were moments in the hospital, and a lot of it was because the medication she was on kind of made her moods go that way. Some of the nausea medicine didn't, you know, kind of just made her more melancholy, but there were times in the hospital, you know, we were gonna be there all week, and she would be just, like, by the third night, just, I just wanna go home and, you know, get really sad. Um, unfortunately, you know, not, I, I wanted to go home too. I felt like crying with her list. I want to go home too, but we can't. Just try to make the best. She she always made the best of it. Um, she wouldn't stay down for long. She would usually snap right back out of it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, I, I didn't, again, if it's too personal, that's fine. I, as, as she got older and it became more sort of dire, I guess, or... or did you guys ever talk about, did she talk about a legacy or, or, or carrying this on the way you guys have? Like, was she aware that you guys were going to 
want to, or really. did she ask you to carry anything out, or, or what would, what do you think her message would want to be? I think, like, if she <laughs> at the at the end. Um, I mean, she never really, you know, she after that one time when she was ten, she never really asked or talked a lot about dying again. I mean, I knew that she knew, but she didn't, she didn't really talk about it. Um, and I don't think she even realized, like, he had set up a Facebook page and she had all these people following her and watching. Mm -hmm. And I don't think she really got just how many people <laughs> She didn't care if he videoed. She was okay with, you know, talking to people and saying hey or whatever. But I don't think she realized just how many people were, were really paying attention. So she never really asked us to do anything. I, I think she would be happy that we are. Um, and happy that you know that that somehow she was still helping people you know even now I, I know she would be happy about that but she never really asked us to, to do anything yeah. no yeah, awesome. yeah. No, well yeah. <clears throat> no that was I mean obviously the story is is deep and uh, I appreciate you sharing it with us yep. so we'll, we'll get We'll get your husband in now. <laughs> Continue that story. You're a taxi. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Can we get a drink of water real quick? Sure. Okay. I'm the emotional one in our family. So, uh, I'm already a wreck and I haven't even started. So yeah. It's, uh, it's a hard conversation. Yeah. Well, and we, we hate having to even like bring it up, but I know you want to, you know, keep her story alive. So, sure. Yeah, take as much time as you need. So the questions will probably sound familiar. <laughs> so, um, yeah, can you, um, we got a lot of detail out of, out of your wife, but can you kind of, you know, go through the process and you can be pretty brief, but maybe just hit on some like key points that, in, you know, that stand out to you as far as um, when she found out and kind of those, those big key moments uh, throughout her, her story. Uh, when Juliana was um, five years old, um, she was stricken with the big C and I can remember the day that um, we got the phone call from a doctor that Juliana was very sick. And um, about three and a half or so years prior to that, my wife's dad died of cancer. So it was still quite fresh. And um, And you can speak to me. You don't have to look down the, okay. down the camera, so it's a little easier. <laughs> uh, I remember standing in the foyer of our house, and uh, sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry. And. Um, when we got the call that she was sick and my wife and I just hugged and cried and cried and cried and cried on her shoulders, each other's shoulders. Because our little girl, you know, so full of life, was so sick. And I remember that night uh, when she was going to bed, Juliana was going to bed, I, uh, I laid next to her bed. I wanted to be as close to her as I could. 
Tammy, my wife, had to come in and say, you know, she'll be okay tonight, you know, when I come to bed. Uh, but seeing Juliana go through all that treatment um, the first time. And then as a, as a parent, uh, once your child is diagnosed, uh, you live in terror that it's going to come back. And the cancer, as Tammy mentioned in the story, kept coming back over and over again. And every time I could see our formerly spunky little girl at age five, before she got sick, uh, she was still happy through the process. Um, but over the years, I started seeing how the weight of being sick was was uh, weighing on her in different ways. Um, she's still very positive, still very um, energetic as far as she could be. Always wanted to do the things that the rest of the kids do. Love to swim, love to run and play, uh, love to do the things that little girls want to do. But those uh, trips to the hospital uh, all the time for a week at a time, was eventually uh, wearing one, and it was a, a long process. And um, it's just we're, we're hollow without her. It's 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 an agony that I can't describe uh, as a parent, and I wouldn't wish on any parent, obviously. Uh, but you go as a parent from living in terror that something's going to happen to your child to living in agony 24/7 that something has happened to your child. And the only way you can see your child again is in a graveyard, you know, and, uh, excuse me, that's just, that's a 22,000 foot story, if you will. Uh, Let me sure. clear my nose, sorry. So just to kind of hit on where you are now, so, um, I mean, during and, and now after, I mean, what kind of toll does this take on 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 family i mean it's it's so much to, to take on not just not just the, the the fact of losing but even just the the toll that it takes going through treatments and on work and on siblings and all those things i mean can you just kind of tell us a little bit about that um while juliana was in in treatment it gave some of our other kids opportunities to indulge in things that they shouldn't be indulging in because we were busy with juliana so that uh, we went through quite a few years of that havoc um, because there were kids and some kids are going to be kids, you know, so we had some real hi real hiccups with that. Um, what was the other part of the question? I'm sorry. Just, I mean, uh, toll on, uh, on your work, if okay, you, if yeah. anything like that. I mean, just, just the reality of like living in these situations. The, in, in, uh, when she was diagnosed the first time, less than six months after she was diagnosed, um, my boss called me up one day and said, John, I took the liberty of cleaning out your office. Where do you want your stuff? At the time, I was making about $140,000 a year. We had just built a seven-bedroom house for each of our six kids to have their own bedrooms. And he literally destroyed our family in the middle of Juliana's treatments. And he knew what he was doing. So, and I wasn't the only one he had done that stuff too but certainly not in the same situation. So our income went from six figures a year to way less than half of that overnight. So that created uh, an enormous strain uh, for many years because it's we haven't recovered from that even though it's been many years later. Um, Work-wise, it was uh, at the time trying to juggle work while she was in, in in treatment was a challenge and I did the best I could again having five other kids still at home so trying to juggle all that at the same time uh, was an enormous challenge and then my wife homeschooled the kids so her trying to homeschool the kids while Juliana is in, in treatment and being very sick and all kinds of other issues happening um, she had to juggle a lot more than I did because she was she had total of six children to, to educate so it was it was a real real challenge through the whole process yeah. um, is there is there anything from 
from the perspective of, of uh, not necessarily giant giving back, but any, any programs that helped in any way throughout that? I mean, is there any, are there, are there any financial benefits to families in, in need, uh, even if it's like housing and stuff that you know of that are, come out of these types of campaigning? There were, let me pause the, the uh, answer. Sure. But you mean through Giant or through other organizations? I want to make sure. I, I just want to. Um, I'm, I'm thinking beyond Giant here. Okay, a little that's bit. What I yeah, yeah. Right. So just like what? Are, it, it, you can be really broad about it. Just like there are programs, okay. you know, in place to help. There, there were several organizations that uh, were amazing with, with us. There were uh, organizations that sent us to the beach uh, uh, several times. Uh, one sent us to Florida one time. Um, one sent us on trips around the area for fun for the kids. Uh, one organization gave Juliana a pool. Um, <laughs> sorry. Which she loved. She was a little fish in the water. She loved that pool, you know. Um, so shortly after she, well not shortly, but a while after she passed away, we gave that pool away because somebody gave it to us, to her. So we didn't think it was right to sell it. So we, we gave the pool to a great family. But there were, uh, there's an organization who gave us um, uh, uh, gasoline cards mm -hmm. to, um, doesn't seem like a big deal, you know, but it's expensive, you know, every day going back and forth to the hospital. Um, but they gave us gas cards to help put gas in the car. Um, and then Chef Irvine, uh, who's a, a great fan of, of Julie, uh, was very instrumental in inspiring Juliana. He, he would call her and FaceTime her regularly uh, just to uh, lift her spirits. And uh, we went and saw him on a, on a show and, and it, he was just, he's just an awesome guy. So there, there are, yes, yeah, several organizations who really stepped up and and were they, they just pulled us in and just hugged us you know that's the best way i can explain it yeah so it's transitioning now that to you're not, you're now on the board of the of the cancer foundation the is a pediatric cancer foundation and and can you kind of describe a what they do and then how you know giants help it, you know, i guess it's helping in those efforts ccf is uh, an organization that's been around for decades they've raised tens of millions of dollars to raise funds to help find cures for diseases that affect these kids. Giant food has been an instrumental part in that process. Giant food gives parents like us hope. During her treatment, we always held on to hope that a cure was going to be found for her you know, before she passed away. Every month I listened to the news and the meetings and all that and, and hoped that they were going to have a cure. That finally she was going to be able to grow up and be a chef. Her goal in life at the time was to, to be a chef. Uh, and she loved to cook, she loved to, to help her mom bake things. Um, so giant food is not only helping to find cures, but giving hopes and hope I'm going to edit this out. It's fine. Giant food not only helps raise funds to find cures, but they also give hope to families that maybe one day a cure is going to be found and their child is going to be able to grow up and live a healthy life. That's the ultimate goal of all these kids. They just want to be healthy. They don't want to have a million dollars in the bank. They just want to be healthy and be normal kids and then grown-ups. That's all they want to do. do. Do you feel like you're, um, well, you, you had told us on the phone call that you're, you told her um, before she passed that you're, you're going to keep her legacy alive and also help to push, you know, to, to come up with cures, right? So, I mean, what did you, what did you promise her and, 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 you know, how are you kind of living that today? Well, I'm not sure if I promised her that when she was alive. When I looked over to, to my right on that morning and I told my wife, I said, I think she's gone. 
um, in the next hour or two as I was kneeling down beside her. I told her, I said, I'm never going to let the world forget about you. That's what I said. I said I'm never going to let the world forget about you. And by that time, she had, I don't know, maybe 100,000 fans that followed her online. And I, I am going to keep that. I'm going to keep my word. And then before they closed the casket, I'm sorry. I told her again, I'm never going to let the world forget about you. And as long as I'm breathing, I'm not going to let the world forget about her. Cause she, I, I used to sing a song to her all the time. I, said, you, I sang to her, you are my sunshine. My little sunshine. I, said, I, I sang, you made me happy when skies are gray. I sang to her all the time. I still sing it to her. I sang it to her the day before she passed away. I sang it to her in the hospital so many times. I sang it to her at the grave all the time. And if there's anything I could do to put a face to this disease, that maybe one day a cure is going to be discovered that's going to save the lives of so many children and stop the agony that families live with 24 hours a day. Well, um, sorry, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gathering my thoughts too. So, <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll just go to when she was an ambassador yeah. for, for Giant, um, and I actually had the same question. But do you? Um, what did that mean to her? How did she? How did she react? And um, understanding what she was, what she was doing, and uh, you know all the all the things. Can you just tell us about that time. Um, Juliana knew because I asked her years before if I could document her journey because one day I wanted to be able to show her children what their mommy had gone through, you know. Um, so when Giant Food made it available that she could share this or a piece of her story, up until that time she had fought it four times. Um, and she was kind of nervous about it because we discovered there's going to be at least 500 people in that room. So it wasn't just, you know, a room full. It was, it was a banquet room full of, of people from Giant Food. But my wife and I, uh, my wife, uh, yeah. pausing so you can edit that out. It's fine. It's easier to edit it out when there's a pause. I, I do enough of that. So my wife and I, I did it again. Gosh. Giving you some break on the That's fine. That's all good. So my wife and Juliana worked on a speech that Juliana was going to share in the meeting. And I remember that she would uh, read it and read it and read it just to get it perfect. Because Juliana is all about excellence. She wanted to do stuff perfectly every time. Whether it was schoolwork or swimming or playing games, she wanted to win every time. So she practiced that speech over and over and over again. So then once she um, got there for that speech, she, she nailed it. She just did it like a pro. And she was very excited about it because she knew and had known up until that time that her story was uh, making some sort of a change in this, this attempt to find cures. She didn't know the vastness of her impact because millions of people online had seen bits and pieces of her story because I've been adamant about sharing parts of her story. So she knew some of it, but um, over the years, I think she started to really understand that her life uh, was touching a lot of people. I can remember when she was in the hospital for the last time, I did a live uh, FaceTime, uh, not FaceTime, but a live stream with her fans or some of her fans. And she couldn't believe, she was amazed, I have that all documented. She couldn't believe how many uh, hearts were popping up as she was talking. It was like four minutes long or something, but she was just, she had, she was just so sick, but she was so touched and so impacted by it. She, she was saying well, something like, man, that's a lot of people. That, and that was just a small fraction of the people who eventually saw it. Um, 
but she was definitely involved and, and, and very much um, interested in, in continuing to share her story. Um, so piggybacking on that, what now would you say to giant customers who are just, you know, they don't, they don't understand the impact or haven't seen these stories or, you know, don't even know what their few dollars of buying a coupon book can do. You know, what, what would you say to them? <laughs> Sorry guys, that's, that's okay. so embarrassing. <laughs> no, it's okay. Men don't cry, right? Uh, I'm a crybaby. <laughs> Every person who shops at Giant Food and contributes to this cause not only gives hope to children that just want to be healthy, but they also give hope to the families of these children who are desperate, who live in terror every single day that something's going to happen to their child. And then if something does happen to their child, then that terror goes to agony. They live in agony every single day that their child is gone forever. They'll never see them again. They'll never be able to hold them again. They'll never be able to hug them ever again. So every dollar, every dime, every quarter that Giant Food contributes to this cause and has contributed to this cause for many, many years is making a difference in the lives of children that just maybe these children will be able to reach their goals and their dreams in life. Giant Food, in my opinion, is one of the heroes on the planet. Because Giant Food just doesn't talk about doing nice things. Giant Food does amazing things for children and families. What thank you is big enough that a parent can give Giant Food for what they're doing? There, there are no words. I mean, thank you? That's, that's not enough. Can, you, can I embrace all the employees at Giant Food? and those who shop at giant food stores. I wish I could, because I'd hug them all, you know? Because each and every one of them are impacting people that they'll never meet. And to me, that's a sign of a hero. Well, that was about as good as it gets as far as, far as that story goes. So. <laughs> um, yeah, do you have any, any other questions? I mean, they, they, you guys are both, you know, incredible at speaking about your daughter. Sure, you told this story many times. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. No, I can't. I can't think of anything else. I mean, we 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 hit on a lot in a in a, a relatively short amount of time. So, I I appreciate you know both of you bringing this to life, and no um, I hope we do it justice for you. So. <laughs> Before you go, can you take a quick snapshot of us in front of all? all sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. We'll get some other B-roll and stuff with you guys, and just yeah, for, for the um, if you have like photos on the walls and stuff, if it's okay, we'll get some oh, of yeah. those things too. And, then, and of course, I know you have things that we can we can get. So uh, the, these cards you can have. Okay. Okay. In fact, you, you can actually have all these if 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 if, if you'd like to scan them maybe okay. at, at, at your office or whatever. It might yeah. be easier for you. Yeah, that would be. I mean, it's always better quality. So. There's shots around. The house, okay, and I've got thousands of other images. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. So, perfect. Let me get my camera so you can use them. Yeah. Is it called? Uh, uh, flashes of hope or flashes something? Flashes of hope, yeah. They take, they take pictures of kids yeah. that have cancer. How did she, um, was when she feel was, about losing her hair? Um, it was upsetting. It was more upsetting the older she got. Mm -hmm. um, Boy, she looks yeah. so happy there. That's incredible. Yeah, that time, that was the second time she had cancer, so she was nine, and only the front came out and the back didn't. Yeah, so she was amazing. happy about yeah. that, that she still had some hair to she cover could wear that a hat time. And look like she <laughs> Exactly. And that was when that was with her with Maddie. That's one of the ones they took when she was an ambassador. Yeah. At the 
So did they come here and shoot in your house? In your uh, house? Well, in the old house. house. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Cool. That was her dog, who just passed away this past November. Really? Where's Maddie? Yes, her dog Maddie. Oh, okay. Amazing. Yeah, that, 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 that's an interesting story. Um, she was sick for the third time, and we thought she, she was going to be gone. Um, so, right. that was that. That was hard. Mm -hmm. um, so, so go ahead, you I said, her. if you had three wishes, what would you like to, what would you like those, those three things to be? Because I, I would not want to tell her that I was terrified that she was going to die because that issue, as Tammy explained earlier, was, was really bad. Um, but I said, what would you like to have? What three things would you like to have? She goes, well, not to be sick, a billion dollars, and then a, a long, it seemed like a long pause, a puppy. Now, by then, we had six kids. I mean, we don't need another mouth to feed, right? <laughs> so within a few weeks of um, that request, we went and adopted a, a puppy. Yeah, and that was a story, too, because she was looking online, and she found a little Shih Tzu at the SPCA up in York, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And, well, we called about it. We found out they don't update their website very often. Mm -hmm. So... We talked to him and we told him, you know, who she was and that she really wanted this puppy and they, they understood she was really sick. And the woman said, you know what, I'm going to take your name and number and if we get one in, I'll give you a call. And I thought, what are the odds they're going to get mm -hmm. a Shizu in? Because they mostly get, you know, like Pit dogs nobody wants. Yeah. Pit <laughs> right. We, we, right. So it was so crazy because like two days later, we're still in the hospital. Two days later, we get a call from the SPCA. You're not going to believe this, but somebody just dropped off a Shizu. Um, we think she's maybe around a year old. Are you interested? And we're like, yes. So mm -hmm. the day after she got out of the hospital, we, went, we drove up to the SPCA to meet the puppy. I mean, she was, I, I had to, in the, I'm in the van disconnecting her from fluids because she, so we can go in. And um, we, we went in and yeah, it was like love at first sight. And the yeah. first thing I said is, that's not a one-year-old dog, that's a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> she was more like five months old. Yeah. But um, yeah, we took her home that day. They're, they were well, so neat. excited that, you know, that they... they Mm-hmm. <laughs>